Good evening, this is Tim Johnston, and the Brattleboro Select Board is next here on ACTV. The board will be acting as liquor commissioners, considering a second-class liquor license for a second location for Wyndham Wines, an educational sampling permit for a holiday wine and beer tasting at the Brattleboro Food Co-op, tentatively scheduled for December 9th. Write that down. The board is water and sewer commissioners. We'll hear the monthly report from consultant Hoyle Tanner and Associates on the wastewater plant upgrade. The board acting as the select board will discuss and be scheduled to approve a preferred design alternative for the bridge design for the new Sunset Lake Road Bridge. In addition, the monthly financial report, an update on the proposed FY13 town budget process, refinancing vehicle lease purchase agreements, discussion about whether to seek a hazard mitigation grant, and second reading on a proposed ordinance change which would add Paul's Road to the list of roads on which parking is prohibited. All that and more coming up. The Brattleboro Select Board is next here on BCTV. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to reconvene our second regularly scheduled meeting for November. Uh, and we do know that the meeting has been officially warned. I would accept a motion on the minutes for November 1. Move to approve the minutes and November 1 is presented. Any additions, corrections, deletions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. No. Oh, excuse me, one abstention. I'm sorry. Four zero one. And I'd accept a motion for the minutes of November 9th. And that was our first budget meeting. I move to approve the minutes on no of November 9th. Any additions, corrections, deletions? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Chair's remarks, uh, only a couple. Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, nine days away, uh, holiday season, and uh, brings a couple things to light. Uh, Project Feed the Thousands uh, will be out and uh, collecting food as we get closer to Thanksgiving. Uh, there's always a, a need for food year, year, all year long, uh, but it seems that we have a heightened awareness at the holiday season. So if you can, while you're shopping, uh, uh, make a purchase and drop it off at one of the bins at the local supermarkets. And also Thanksgiving uh, is the start of the collection for the uh, Reformer Christmas stocking, also very big in uh, Brattleboro and the surrounding areas. Uh, their goal is uh, $94,000 or $95,000 this year. Uh, significant demand uh, that demand is constantly going up and I know that they appreciate the generosity of uh, our community and the surrounding community so uh, making you aware of two things that uh, uh, our our town uh, seems to do very well it is giving and uh, thank you for doing that that's all I have Barb uh, you have anything um, yeah, just a couple of things. One is that um, the Brattleboro community lost a valuable and beloved member this um, last week. Uh, Phil Dunham passed away last Thursday, November 10th. He was um, very much involved with our local recreation and many other activities. Um, our condolences to his family. The other is just a mundane update. The I-91 bridge project, there has been a delay with that. Um, it had to do with the steel. Um, there was some delay in getting the steel. They are going to continue to work on that project um, as far into the winter. I believe they're um, going to be still be pouring concrete and do, doing some curing of the concrete um, into the winter. And I think really working throughout the whole winter is what, what they're saying now um, in order to get um, to move on to the next side to the um, southbound side 
of the I-91 bridge. So um, just to let people know that is a delay, but I think they are hoping to kind of get back on schedule. Rick, do you have anything There's you'd like to add? On the December, yeah, they're hoping December it will be open. And then they'll continue to the rest of what you're working underneath mm -hmm. on the other bridges. So. This is uh, just to give people a little background information. This is the first bridge in the state that is a design build. And so it's, it wasn't one where the design was done beforehand. It's, it's as you go, that's when the design is. And uh, they just got the steel on actually for the big bridge uh, three weeks ago. High performance steel. But the good note is the other bridge on the other side is identical. Everything's ordered. There should be no holdups mm -hmm. on that. And I, the, the bridge over Maple Street is complete. Yes. That is all complete. So we're happy about that. Uh, select board committee reports. Christopher? Oh, um, are you going to talk about the library? You can. I, okay. You, yeah, okay. I, I actually have three items I wanted to talk about. I've been kind of busy over the last uh, couple of weeks. <clears throat> Both Dora and I have sat on the uh, strategic planning, uh, the annual strategic planning process that the uh, library sponsored. Um, uh, we attended the second four-hour meeting, which was really quite an eye-opener. Uh, library is, of course, the cultural heart of Brattleboro. Um, and represents a long strand in the intellectual history of the community. Um, very interesting that the word book was not mentioned very often because of the importance of all the other changes and things that are happening in the use of the library and the things that the library does. It was a huge eye-opener. I would um, recommend that uh, uh, people take a look at all the things that the library does and all the services that they have and, and the programs that they offer. Second is that I um, attended last week uh, a meeting of the Wastewater Treatment Plant Construction Oversight Committee, um, and uh, which consisted mainly of a tour of the progress there. Um, as I indicated uh, when I last talked about uh, my, my last trip there, uh, I, I tell you, I felt like um, a kid walking into a Richard Scarry book with all the construction going on on this enormously complex and sophisticated project. Um, they, uh, they're, they're making progress here, they're making progress there, they're trying to do all this while the plant continues to function uninterrupted and uh, through thick and thin, uh, even during the flood, uh, at, at which time waters actually uh, threatened the uh, the, the, the facility and they had to stop construction for a day. Um, uh, and uh, they showed us uh, a uh, half of the, of the two new pressers that have come in. That's a big expense, $460,000 on those two items that are, that are a big piece of the, of, the, of the process. What I came away with was a, was a huge appreciation for all the careful work that's going on um, that has to be done on an extremely coordinated basis um, with the with the town uh, with the town staff, uh, especially the operator, um, and I, I, I continue to be wowed by the fact that this new facility, when it goes in, is going to offer a number of new uh, efficiencies, and I think it bears repeating. Um, it's going to, rather than flare off the methane that's produced, burn it in a cogeneration that's going to help. Um, it's going to generate electricity and reduce our CVS, CVPS bill. Um, it's going to separate stormwater from the influent, which is going to, which is going to lend efficiency to the progress. Um, it's going to be uh, something where we can charge uh, for uh, uh, organizations to, um, to, to add to the influent um, for pump outs. Um, we're going to be able to sell the byproduct sludge. Um, which is going to be a Class A product. It's going to be unregulated, meaning you can do anything with it, like put it on your garden. And after all is said and done with what goes through that plant, the water being returned to the Connecticut River is going to be Class A water, fit to drink. And that Connecticut River, which when I was a boy was regarded as, uh, as, as a sorry sewer, 
it, it is, is getting cleaned up one town at a time, um, and Brattleboro is going to be doing exactly the right thing for the long term by, by, by returning Class A water to the Connecticut, which is um, a sleeper of a resource for us. And I, I just have to say how impressed I am by, um, by, by, by what I saw and how it was being done, the scope of it um, and, and the process, the, the professionalism, the cooperation. My hat's really off to everybody involved down there. Um, and it's really impressive. If you, anybody is interested in seeing that, I understand that uh, you just need to call and ask and, and just walk down and see. It's just an amazing project at work. At $32 million, not a bad idea to go see your tax dollars at work. And the last and third item um, is that I went and sat in on the tree committee um, because I felt that I should be going out and, 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 and sitting in on, on as many committees as I can as a member of the select board. And I wanted an interesting time last week. Um, I wanted to just bring to um, the public's attention the fact that the state, Department of Forests, Parks and Recreation, and the Agency of Agriculture are looking for what they call highly, motiv volunt highly motivated volunteers to assist the state in preparing for and responding to the introduction of some very dangerous invasive forest pests, the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, the emerald ash borer, and the Asian longhorned beetle. These are insects that truly are a threat to our community by way of um, the threats to the forests, which are a big part of what draw people to our, to our, or to our state and are an important part of our economy. Um, anybody who would like to get some training in this and be a volunteer is, um, is encouraged to contact um, the Forest Pest First Detector Program Coordinator, name of Kate Forer with the UVM Extension Service and the number is 802-223-2389, extension 210, and of course you can um, we can call the, uh, the town manager's office and get this information also. Um, but <clears throat> I would point out that, that this is really important work and can save us some money. Uh, big, big bucks here um, down in Worcester, Mass. Um, uh, the longhorned beetle infestation of 2008 there resulted in the expense of removing 25,000 urban and suburban shade trees in a 32 square mile quarantine area in and around Worcester. Um, you can imagine the expense, if you ever had a tree taken down, several hundred dollars at a time, multiply that by 25,000 and you've got quite a hit and also think of the effect on the appearance of the town. Um, the emerald ash borer, by, uh, for example, is uh, something we may end up seeing here in Brattleboro, the parking lots here, dotted with, with ash trees, green ash I understand. Uh, this is a big deal. This is a big opportunity for a volunteer. Um, interestingly, the benefits um, indicated on the job description are that you could be on the front line of defense against forest pest infestations, and you can prepare your community uh, to deal with infestation. The earlier we detect an infestation, the better the outcome. As I said, this is a very big deal for our community. It's a quiet issue. We don't hear about much about it. But I think it's as, it may be as important for our economy as the flu shot is to most of us. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Dora? Um, just to add to what uh, Chris said about the library, um, because they are in the middle of doing a strategic plan, um, I'm sure that the board would be very happy to entertain anybody's ideas for services and the, what the physical space might look like in the future. So if people. Um, want to send their thoughts or speak to a board member um, for the library, I, I think that they'd be happy to hear that. Um, I just want to add to, um, to Dick's list of um, um, entities that we should be looking for for fundraisers. The Heat Fund um, is Very beginning. They've got, a, they've got their first fundraiser tomorrow at the Hooker Dunham, um, and uh, they'll be looking for donations as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, public participation, an opportunity for you to speak about something that is not on our agenda here this evening. And as I look out at the audience, it looks like uh, everyone here has something on the agenda. 
Uh, but in case someone's walking through the door as I speak. Can I, can I just say something about Phil Bonham? You mind? Uh, I'm a member of the public. <laughs> yes, you are. I know. I talk too much. I know. I know. But I want to say something about Phil Dunham. I've known him for a long, long time. And uh, Phil was the flying dentist. You know, um, we know um, Fred Harris as the person who was behind the construction of the uh, ski jump. Phil Dunham was really behind the use of the ski jump. Um, it, he, has, he, he endlessly and energetically promoted the ski jump um, as the first extreme sport. And there's evidence of this downstairs on the first floor in the Historical Society exhibit where there's a photograph of him and two other people going off that jump at once. Um, so he really did make the most of an extreme sport. Um, um, he leaves a lot of himself behind in the community. Um, and uh, I, I thought it was really worth pointing out what a, what a valuable person this was to the very culture of Brattleboro. So thank you. Thank you. I'd accept the motion to go into liquor commissioners. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Five zero. We are liquor commissioners. Okay, first up, you have a second class liquor license <coughs> request, uh, Wyndham Wines, and two folks from Wyndham Wines are here, Frank and Martha. Um, they are asking this to be a second location at the North End Butchers. Um, North End Bu Butchers did have a uh, does have a liquor license. They are not going to be utilizing their liquor license anymore. They have um, they're kind of revamping their store and what they're doing. Um, in this, one of the things they're doing differently is partnering with Wyndham Wines. Um, so, um, Frank and Martha, if you would like to come to the um, microphone and tell us a little bit about your application and your new your second location. <laughs> Oh, I guess I've been nominated as the uh, spokesperson uh, between us. I'm behind you 100%. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, Chris Berry approached us uh, a month and a half ago when the uh, North End Butchers closed, much to the surprise and chagrin of many of us. And uh, one of the issues was just uh, overhead costs, and he said he's spending time and uh, resources having such a big s retail space and he didn't need all of that space in front of the counter, uh, would we like to take over the wine sales in that area? So we couldn't think of a reason not to. Um, and so we started the ball rolling and that's, uh, so, so here we are now asking you for permission to uh, be the, the people selling the beer and wine out there. Thank you. Well, uh, there, there is a little bit of an issue here. I had a conversation with uh, Annette Cappy, and for uh, we can approve this, but the state's not going to issue you a license until North End Butchers sends up their license uh, to them. Now, just to make people aware, you can have two liquor licenses in one uh, building, but you cannot have two liquor licenses in one location. And so, therefore, until they turn theirs in, you won't be issued a liquor license. So they're going to have to have that. We can approve it. It may get sent up there, but they're not going to send it back until uh, North End Butchers uh, does that. I had Annette Cappy call them this afternoon Great. and uh, yeah. to get them uh, moving on that process. So uh, that, that was actually one of our questions yeah. to them was how do we – how does North End Butchers relinquish their license? Yeah, because they, we knew they actually they, have to put a, a check mark through yeah. their license, license and then okay. send it up to the state. All right. uh, and then you'll uh, be Chris is happy to do that. We're not happy to do it, but you know he'd love sure. to get it prorated. Okay. But, yeah. So uh, I would accept them. Can our motion reflect that? Uh, it's not. It, it doesn't have to reflect that because it's not going to. The state is not going to issue the license until. North End Butcher's license gets up there. So it's, no it's almost a moot point for us. We're approving it, but the state <coughs> who has final authority is not going to issue the license until the North End Butcher license is, gets back up there for them. So I would accept a motion here. I move approval. 
Uh, want more something more formal? No. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> no. To approve a second I, second. I, 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 mo I move to uh, let me um, uh, <clears throat> amend my uh, my own uh, uh, remark earlier to approve the second class liquor license for Wyndham Wines LLC doing business as Wyndham Wines at its second location at 972 Putney Road. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have um, a request for an educational sampling permit, Brattleboro Food Co-op, and I see Sabine is here to talk about that. Um, and if you want to tell the board what you're going to be sampling, when and why. We're just um, doing a holiday sampling of about 40 wines and 12 beers. Uh, and the River Garden will be, um, of course, uh, checking entry, uh, valid IDs at the entry. Uh, the idea is for people to learn about uh, the wide variety of wines and beers um, in advance of the holiday season. We thought it might be a good time to do that. So um, there is one amendment. We have it scheduled uh, on your paperwork from 6 to 8.30. We're actually going to move it up half an hour and do it 5.30 to 8. Okay. So it's beer, wine, and something else? Sparkling wines. Spiritus liquor is what? Sparkling wines. That's. It's, you know, champagne. Yeah. Wine is, is and beer. Spiritus liquor. That's. What champagne is? No, um, I don't know what spiritus liquor is, but I'm distilled. Spiritus liquor is just there the will way be it's no distilled liquors mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. This is I, a I'm wine reading beer. directly from the event the permit. List. Spirit, spiritus liquor shall be offered in glasses that contain no more than one quarter ounce of each beverage. I believe that's uh, one of the standard boilerplate. Gotcha. Um, right, that's not actually that's from the state. That's right. We're, we're just doing wines and beers. <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, and it looks like you have, uh, I see your application for permit with BABB because it's in the River Garden. That's right. We got approval from them. Okay. I would accept a motion. Hey, I'll, uh, there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll Earn your uh, keep. Move to approve an educational sampling permit for holiday wine and beer tasting by the Brattleboro Food Co-op at the River Garden on December 9, 2011 from 530? 5.30 until 8 o'clock. Okay. Further discussion? Dora? Um, so, one, because it, it's gallery walk night. No. Um, it's not gallery walk night? No. No, it's the second it's Friday. The second. Oh, this is the night. Yeah, we really didn't um, want to do it on Calvary Walk Night. Just one, you were talking about having somebody at the door. Yes. Um, and there's a very active back door. Yes, we'll um, have someone to, at the back door okay. as well, yes. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much, yes. <laughs> uh, but that is also a public restroom there, so. But it'll be closed as a private event that okay. night. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, no other questions? All those in favor of the motion on the floor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I accept the motion to adjourn as liquor commissioners. Move to adjourn as liquor commissioners. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? 5 0. Oh, I'd accept the motion to go into water and sewer commissioners. Move to enter water and sewer commissioners. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 5 0. Oh, we are now water and sewer commissioners. The board has um, in their packets the monthly report from Hoyle Tanner on the progress being made um, with the upgrade at the wastewater treatment plant in town. Um, while I did have in here um, no requested action, I did realize um, and when I was reviewing the packet that um, there there is a cha the change order number three is in the is in the packet. <coughs> And it is a total of $9,231. The reason I, was, I missed it was because all of the, there's one, uh, about six items um, that make up that $9,000. They're all under the um, 5000 that the board had um, set as the maximum that the public works director could set. However, I do think it would still be good practice for the board um, to actually approve change order number three so that we do continue to have that. So if 
if the board would be, um, if someone sure. would um, maybe make a motion to approve change order number three in the amount of $9,231. When you get to that point. Okay. <clears throat> and Ricky Fear, um, Public Works Department, is here to answer questions or talk about the report <coughs> or dance. We had a weekly meeting this morning and I did a walk through the same as you and I did the other day. Uh, Headworks building, the tanks are starting to be formed up and poured. The first primary clarifier is the concrete work is complete and the mechanical parts should be arriving within the next two weeks to get installed in that one. They're working in the flooring building, they're working in the control building, they're working in the headworks building and the watering building. They're working everywhere and everything proceeds better than I could have ever anticipated so far keep our fingers crossed. But things are working good. No huge problems still to this point. Um, these change orders, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to ask me. A uh, question I have, uh, because I don't remember the, the timeline, uh, this says approximately 44% uh, of the project is complete. Uh, ahead of schedule or on schedule? Pretty close on. The weather so far this year has helped. We've been pouring concrete right through. Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, the first question I have um, relates so that we can just be sure the total amount of the contingency that would cover potential change orders. Am I understanding that that's more than a million dollars, a million, one and a quarter for starters? Mm -hmm. yes. And so at this point, we're actually about $61,000 under budget, but that doesn't count the first increase of $75,000? The, the $75,000 credit we got for the MBVR is reflected there. That's why we're ahead. That was right. a bigger credit than any of the other changes. But we have like a three or four percent total uh, contingency fund and we're really only a little bit into that so far. Is that fair to say? But, yeah, it's five percent of the contract amount is contingency 5%. and so far we're ahead. The other question I had and I just wanted to make sure that the board was comfortable, maybe Rick you can uh, weigh on in on this a little bit. Um, what was the criteria that we um, agreed on previously that the committee could uh, or the subcommittee could make changes uh, without our, our separate approval? Actually, it's not the committee. It's the um, Director of Public Works right. and $5,000 on, on, an, on any items under $5,000. Are we still comfortable, given the accumulation of items to about a $9,000 change order, that that's the right criteria? As opposed to one. I don't know what the alternative would be. I just want to make sure that Barb, mm -hmm. as town manager, and Rick, as the representative from Public Works, think that that's the right uh, uh, criteria we should be using. I, you know, personally, I think it's probably low. I probably would have gone with ten thousand because that matches our okay, capital. That's, okay, that's what it's um, yeah. But, uh, but I, you know, I if the board was comfortable for five at five thousand, I'm up to the discretion of the board. We'll do whatever. <laughs> I think that works. I think it works for now, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Any other uh, questions for uh, Rick? Dora? Well, just to follow up on what David's asking, um, because there, there are a lot of little things that are adding up, and I know that this happens in projects, and I'm just, um, just want to get an idea on sort of comparative to projects as far as number, you know, percentage numbers of, you know, changes because um, when you add it to a lot of the other ones that have been added on it's mm -hmm. it's quite a list mm -hmm. um, and some you know some of it I'm looking at of course I don't even know I, I'm obviously I'm not an engineer but I'm you know I look at it and I'm like well why wasn't it in the original plan <laughs> right well and I think they um, they tried they do try to show that why um, I think some of it may be just as they're going I mean, part of it is, is as they're going through, they're, they'll note things that aren't going to work or that they need to change while they're in process. Um, you know, but realistically, 
you know, I, I would agree that small things add up, but, you know, with a $32 million project, um, to have change orders, to have a, things wait for, you know, for anything under $5,000 would probably um, pennywise pound foolish, I think. Um, you know, at some point, you know, I would, I, I feel comfortable with this level of discretion being given, um, you know, because again, part of it is too, also note that these are always reviewed, negotiated, and then recommended by the engineer. Then they go to the, the public works director. Then they go to the committee, who the citizen committee, and then they come to the board. That uh, you met that committee, right, Christopher? Yeah. Yeah, they're outstanding. They they're really are. They are on top of this. Yeah. So yeah. I, I feel very comfortable with the process that we're uh, we're using in the scrutiny that uh, this project is getting. Would it be helpful uh, to the board? Because I, I, I would I agree with David in that, you know, where you're at with your contingency because the contingency isn't, isn't money meant to be spent, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, would it be um, helpful maybe when we get these reports or when we get the uh, change orders that we also, that report also contain the information on the contingency and I guess it does something. Well, it talks it's, about it's there, the that's remaining. Yeah, it does yeah. talk about the remaining, so, yeah. Because there, there, not only there are ads, there are credits too, so. Uh, yeah. So, one, I have one more and that is just because I'm looking at the report from Hoyland Tanner about the piles, and it says 150 of the 211 piles, but then I was reading Rick's report, um, monthly report, and and Rick was reporting that pretty much all of them have been done, and so I- For this I, year. For this, There's oh, more okay. to go next year. So, they, they are so the ones this. that haven't been done are basically the ones that they're gonna do this year, and then they're gonna do more. Everything for this year is done. They have okay. to do the ones for the new, Digest the next construction next. season. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, I, I just was wondering if maybe you had a more updated information. <laughs> so maybe we could just, um, in some instances, get a little more of an explanation as to what the changes are for so that, rather than just a listing, since we don't really understand them, since we're not engineers. Um, Yes, we want. And I, 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 I certainly think the committee is capable, and I, you know, it's going through the public process, and that's fine with me. But um, actually, Rick, can you go through the change orders? Can you explain why some of these are, or if not, that's fine too. Uh, the first one, storm drain, flat gate, and wall. It's just a better way to install flaps. It'll be more durable, and we won't have to be replacing it as soon. It's just a better way to do the job. Uh, the second one, we just moved the sampler to a more desirable location for us to do daily sampling. It was designed to be one place in the chlorine contact tank and we're going to have to dig a little bit and move it to be in a better spot. And the state also has a little say in where that's got to be. We can't just randomly do what we want. Mm -hmm. um, number three is a different kind of valve which they designed to go on these new rotary presses and actually Mr. Chapman operated one of them when he was down there. I did. So you said how easy it turned. But they had <laughs> a different kind of valve and as they keep improving the design, Let's they thought this was a better thing. From now on, I'm <laughs> you checked it out. You, really you should have taken video, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's not the plant operator. <laughs> That's a whole different change so order. And <laughs> finally, the, the, the biggest Phil, one. It was Phil Chapman. No, it was. Chris. You were there. I was there. Um, the last one and the biggest one, the contact tank drain pipe, that was originally designed to have a couple of valves and uh, check valves and so on. It's the one we have to clean the chlorine contact tank. We have to drain it. And right now we have to pump it and run hose across the, the grounds and all this stuff to do it. 
with this design, it's, it'll be a gravity drain. We had to put in more pipe, more excavating, but there's no mechanic. There's a lot less mechanical components to break and need repair. It's kind of like That's good. we can pump it right through there. It feeds gravity. It drains automatically and <coughs> should be maintenance-wise a big savings down the road. Okay. It's a bigger upfront cost, but it's going to save us in the end. I move to approve change order number three in the total amount of $9,231. Thank you, David. Uh, further discussion? Yeah, I'd suggest, uh, once again, people go down and see their $32 million at work at Dora. Next meeting, I want you to be able to um, tell us what, a, what the snout hood is. And, uh, <laughs> I think you should go down there. I think I'll you should scope there. it out, and I think you should make a report at the next meeting. I've been smelling the poop before. That's right. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of that motion on the floor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. And any more questions for Rick? Seeing none, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next one. You're up again. Uh, I will accept the motion uh, to adjourn as uh, Water and Sewer Commissioners. So moved. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. We are into uh, unfinished business. At the board's last meeting, um, you received a presentation by the um, engineers, and actually if you want to come on up, that'd be great, um, who are doing the um, design work on the um, Sunset Lake Road Bridge. Um, they presented you with the preferred design, and the board wanted to because it wasn't um, on the agenda last time as an action item, um, the board wanted to delay the um, vote on this and until this meeting. Um, and so with that, you are here. I'm just going to renew the motion from last time because uh, I don't see anybody here and I'm not aware of any new information. So I move to endorse the preferred design alternative for the Sunset Lake Road Bridge number 7 over at Halliday Brook. Um, of precast concrete voided slabs construction with the traffic control alternative of the one lane temporary bridge as presented and recommended by the engineers. Uh, further discussion? Yeah, just yes, Christopher. Just, yeah, um, <clears throat> last week there were a couple of, uh, of people who live in the area expressing interest in the uh, in, in, in re retaining some kind of character of the. Uh, of the stonework that was in there as a support, and, and they were told that um, that you could put a, a a certain pattern in the form to to sort of give the impression of, uh, of stonework. And um, just as an aesthetic thing, is that going to be any problem at all to incorporate that? Uh, it wouldn't be a problem. However, uh, the state would not pay for that cost. They would consider that an amenity. And and what kind of cost are we talking about? Uh, probably in form liners. I mean, the trouble with form liners depends on what form liner you get, obviously. I mean, there's really good form liners, and then there's not so good form yeah. liners. And then the question is, is it simply a form liner with the concrete, or are you talking staining the stones so they look like stones? No, no, no. No, no, no just no, a form just, liner? Just, a, just, just to give it some texture. I mean, ballpark, and... you're probably talking 50000 to 100000 Oh, my God. Are you kidding? Yeah. Why? Because uh, they, ha it's just it's in terms of forming, and they can't use their standard plywood forms. They have to account for that and okay. put that in. But I can look into that as well if you want. I mean, that's something that certainly at the preliminary stage we can look into. And if we find the cost is greater than the town wishes to, yeah, fifty thousand dollars. I think it's safe to say is too much. But okay. you know, if you could just do something to you know, keep it from being just this bland face. I mean, but you know, other than that, that's the only thing that I would contribute okay. to this. But not $50,000 worth, that's for sure. <laughs> Nora? Um, well, I just want to say that, um, that there, there were people who were expressing that they would like it looked into about whether or not dry stone would work. And I think from the perspective of sort of process, when you, know, you come back, um, if there could be a cost <clears throat> comparison um, to dry stone versus, you know, the, the cement, um, you know, just, just so that the people who are asking for that have a sense that that has been looked into because, um, 
Well, in terms of constructability, we probably uh -huh. wouldn't go with dry stone blade. We would do either a form liner or we would put a bench and then we would cap, we wouldn't, ca well, we could. We could either cast the stone into it or we could put dry, you know, blade stone in there and then we put mortar behind it so it looked like dry, you know, blade stone of some sort. Uh, the economical and practicality of using dry blade stone for an abutment you know, that's not cost effective uh -huh. uh, for you as a town or for the state of Vermont. But certainly in terms of, of doing that, we did look into that and we estimated an order of magnitude cost of around $150,000 a difference in terms of going with a regular concrete abutment versus utilizing the stone. And that cost would again be borne by the town. Um, the, the state would consider that non-participating in that's simply based on the fact that they consider the existing abutments to be non-historic, and therefore, in their mind, you know, there's no historic relevance. To, or I don't say relevance, but you know, it's not historic. Um, the surrounding area is not a historic district, and therefore, um, in terms of the practicality of that, it would be cheaper and more affordable to go with a concrete cast in place, or not cast in place, but concrete abutment. Well, I, I understand that. I'm just thinking. I, I'm just thinking from the perspective of the comments that were made by by people who were who were in the neighborhoods. That if that information were provided, that that would make it easier for them to sort of understand why you're not doing oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did send a memo uh, to Steve uh -huh. on last Friday. What we didn't realize is Steve is on vacation. Um, so um, it okay. was anticipated that that would be. But yeah, I mean that. I guess cool. That there is a memo, and I sent it to Steve. And this is that's, that's what you folks have. Yeah, I think it was oh, circulated to the select board. board. Yep. Sorry, yeah. it, it's uh, Steve forwarded it to us today, um, this morning. Well, I, I thank Dora for inquiring again uh, on behalf of the people who aren't in attendance tonight. <laughs> but I think what we're hearing is that it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars to make it look like stone, and a hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. Um, to do some other form of construction, and I think the pressing need here is to have a bridge that's going to carry traffic on it um, in a cost-effective manner on Sunset Lake. And I, you know, I'm ready to, uh, to approve this design alternative. I am too. Thank you, Dora. I just want to comment um, that the last time we had this on the agenda, it was commented by the chair that he would acquiesce to my request to wait because it wasn't warned and you know I have to say that this is not the first time that this has happened where a project manager particularly with something connected to VTrans has come for the board with the intention of wh where it's been warned that it's been a, pr it's a presentation where they're presenting information and then they say at the end oh by the way we need you to vote on this there was no information provided to us ahead of time there was no information provided to the abutters ahead of time and you know, just from the, the st standpoint of even if you don't even want to say that we're following open meeting law properly, just from the sense that a local lawyer identifies himself as a direct abutter, just for that reason alone, you shouldn't do it. So, you know, I mean, the, 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 I, I, I get frustrated with, you know, people feeling like I forced them into doing that. Um, it it's very clearly was warned in a particular way. And, well, the only thing I would say to that, Dora, is that uh, when we had our uh, public meeting at the site, there were uh, uh, many abutters there that made comment, uh, and uh, a couple of those comments were placed into the record, uh, one about the stone and, and making sure that we replace the stone. Yep. Uh, awesome. And so uh, from that standpoint, uh, that's what we were talking about. And... Uh, so uh, we'll take your comment, and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, but we're ready for a vote. Uh, seeing that, all those in favor of the motion on the floor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, under new business now, we have the monthly financial report for the period ending October 31st. And John O'Connor, finance <coughs> director, is looking forward to presenting you the numbers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, as of the end of October, we're a third of the way through the year. Our general fund expenditures are coming in at 39.43% of the budget. And that is a little higher than what we would have expected. But it's due to the fact that we made a transfer of over a million dollars to the capital fund, as well as our tropical storm Irene expenditures. Um, as of yesterday, we have spent 
$137,000 on payroll related expenses uh, related to Irene and $613,762 relative to materials and services. So the number is quite large. We have uh, completed two of our first, uh, what they call project worksheets with FEMA. They've been approved by local FEMA officials and entered into their system for reimbursement. Uh, the reimbursement process will take months, but at least the first two items are in there. They were for police and fire uh, emergency service work that they did right after Irene hit. The total of those two worksheets was $84,772, oh uh, of which the town's portion of that is 8477 So we have started the process with FEMA, and we are continuing to move ahead now with all of the public works projects. John, there was a press account uh, uh, today indicating that some towns might be having difficulty uh, making payments on their obligations to the education fund uh, because of uh, uh, Irene-related <coughs> expenses. I think I know the answer as a result of our budget meeting, but could you please just uh, confirm uh, for the purposes of, you know, the people who are watching on TV, are we going to be able to make our obligations to the education fund at the same time we're incurring Irene-related expenses? Yes, we will. And we're a receiving town, so we don't make a, an additional contribution to the education fund. Thanks. Okay. You never asked a question during this portion of the meeting. Um, <laughs> in the, it's very exciting. The, can you help me understand the taxes portion a little bit more? Is it like the meals, alcohol, and rooms part where it, it, have we just we haven't done that collection yet? Is that the Right, we haven't received our first payment. That should be in in the next few days, though, I believe. Actually, yeah. Those are, quarterly, quarterly. Those quarterly. are quarterly payments, well, and they three. come from the state of Vermont. And, yeah. okay. Sorry. and we haven't gotten any yet? No, because the year runs. So the, the payment that we're going to get is we're going to get a check for uh, July, August, and September. And that check usually comes... It'll come the, right around now, and then the check for October, November, December will come in mid-February. So they always lag behind about a month and a half, those checks. Do we but, have a way of telling? Because I would assume that that one would very much be affected by Irene. Well, that, that, had, that, that's, that money there is actually collected by the state, mm -hmm. all right? We approved it. The state takes a percentage of they take the VIG, as we like to call it, and then we're getting like 0.66% of that 1% because we don't do the collection of that money. Mm -hmm. And so they do the collection and then they send us a check, uh, which is usually a month, month and a half after the quarter closes. And that's how it's been since we've participated in the program. So do we have a sense if it's going to look like this $306,000? No, it's going to look, uh, we get quarterly checks, right, right. that's the total. And so there, there's a history, and I'm actually anticipating this quarter's check to be one of the higher ones just because of the flood mm -hmm. and all the people that we had staying here and working in the area. And so going out eating, and that's what's affected the rooms, meals, and tax. So I'm actually anticipating this quarter's check to be one of the higher ones gotcha. that we have received. So. And Dick, I might also add that Yankee had a refueling outage as well. That's right. right. So there are a lot of people here with A lot of people in the area, so. Because <clears throat> that would be a helpful number to know and know going into Saturday, too, if it's more than... Or not really? It's that number that we have in the budget is uh, we're pretty comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, it really hasn't been lower than that, but it hasn't been a hasn't whole been lot higher, higher right. either. So, you know, you're, you're taking a big chance if you're projecting revenue. When you project revenue like that, you get kind of on shaky ground. You can right. say, well, we think we're going to get 320000 And if you only get three hundred and six, 
you're going to have to make that delta up someplace else by not spending what the difference is. So we've always been pretty conservative, but we've been pretty close on that, that guesstimate also. Can I, can I ask one more? Sure. The collection charges one, where already <laughs> we're $16,500 more than what we had budgeted, <laughs> will that just continue to go up? I don't know the answer to that, Ken. I think that's because of the tax sale, isn't it? I would assume that's it's what it's related of, to. Yeah, and that's the collection charges is, again, a little bit hard. Um, it's kind of like the penalties. Um, uh, it depends on who doesn't pay their taxes. <laughs> and so it's a little bit hard to judge. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to go with a... Um, I think what you may want to look at with regard to the FY13 budget is in your, is that five year um, analysis of actual because that will show you um, kind of a better historic run. Um, and actually the, the collection charges for FY 2011 uh, were budgeted at 20. Uh, the actual was 18518. Uh, and this year's budget that we're in, it's budgeted at 20,000. Right. Uh, we don't have a year to date. Uh, well, we unless you go by this there, yeah. that's right. And then in the FY13 budget, it's budgeted at 20,000. So, but we could, that's a good thing to look at. Is, is and that's why we give the five the history year history. Yeah. Can I then ask where does the uh, since Ken's asking questions about uh, uh, this, this tax mm -hmm. is part of the budget in the revenue section. Um, the figures for budgeted and actual current taxes, that's uh, uh, real estate taxes, that's fair to say? Yes. And is that uh, money that was collected all last year and is now part of this year's budget? No, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> the revenues recognized when the tax bills go out. So we recognize all the revenue for taxes at the time the bills are sent out, and we carry a receivable for that amount. Where do we track whether the tax money is actually being collected? Do we ever see those factor those those figures? You don't see those figures generally. They would be in the balance sheet. You could though, if you were interested. And part of the reason you don't is because um, typically because of the taxes and because of tax sales even if you if you don't get the um, if you don't get the taxes in the current year you will get them in the next year if we do the tax sale and that's why you can do it on that on the basis as that as opposed to water and sewer which we use the and um, we do it on a cruel basis because those are actually the billing changes Yep. And we, we do those as we receive the funds, not when we bill. No, I think we also, when we bill, we bill quarterly. Right. And I think when we do the bills, that's when we recognize the revenue. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Okay. Dora? Because we do tax sales too. And um, actually, if you, uh, you ask a question, I would ask that you give the page so the other board members might be able to. Um, Definitely, um, page 8 of 15, um, fire um, towards the bottom, building repairs. Um, notice that we're sort of halfway through that budget, are we anticipating, um, is there, was that sort of regular maintenance or was that an unanticipated? Um, Usually with building repairs with fire, they have, oh wait, let me think. Usually they have a project identified for their building repairs. This, right. I would have to look in for sure and see what this was, though. I don't, I don't know I for don't sure. Either. I just noticed that it's you know half, mm -hmm. half of the budget, and I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something. The only thing I'm wondering, unless it's that gener their generator, that went out. It could be. It could be the generator. We can check, check yeah. that for you tomorrow. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank okay. you.
again. Um, budget update. Oh, thank you. Budget update. Um, um, last. Okay, I'm sorry. Wednesday. <laughs> last Wednesday, I'm sorry. Um, last Wednesday, the board held their first um, fiscal year 13 budget um, meeting, and I just thought we'd bring the citizens up to speed. Um, partially, too, to announce that you know, there's also going to be a budget meeting on um, this Saturday, the 19th, beginning at 8.30, here on the select board meeting room. People are invited to these. Um, and so currently, um, the budget that was presented without any cash contribution to um, for capital improvements, the budget was at about a 3.5 percent increase, or about $487,000, and that 50 percent of that, or over to almost $250,000 of that, is just bonds and benefits. Um, bonds we have. Um, the first principal payment on a, on a $1.8 million bond, um, so it's about 300000 And so that increased the bonds um, by about 125000 I believe. Um, so the big issue that we have um, facing us is, as, although the board only went through a couple of um, departments, um, I'm just trying to give uh, the citizens an idea of, of the struggles that the board will be facing over the next um, budget meetings. The capital fund, um, and these are the projects that are over $10,000 um, with, with a life expectancy of at least 10 years, five years. Um, this FY13, there is approximately almost $2 million, close to $2 million, just in, in that could be cash um, for capital projects. That would take the um, budget to uh, almost, almost an 8% um, increase. Um, obviously, I don't think anyone um, sitting here is okay with that, and I don't think anyone sitting here is okay with the 3.5 where we are, <laughs> even without capital. Um, so there are going to be the discussions that will be occurring um, over the next budget meetings, and again, Saturday at 8.30, are going to be a more detailed um, analysis of the budgets and where there are possible cuts, and again, looking at the capital fund and trying to figure out <clears throat> with the capital fund um, what are the priorities of that? Um, the capital, um, our capital improvement plan, um, we look at a, about a five year um, plan, and it's, um, we've got some, some big ticket items. Um, some of the things the board has requested, um, the board requested that the, to see the change in the budgets, both, both in a percent and a dollar um, format, and that was um, finance director handed that out to the board this evening. Um, the board has asked for um, a closer review by staff on streetlights, risk management, um, energy costs related to the municipal center, um, our debt service, which again goes to our bonds and lease payments, um, the contract for the trash collections, and um, Oh, and our, our um, contracts that we utilize for um, computer computer services. Um, those were some of the things, that, and that's just a real brief um, from the first meeting overview of what was looked at. Um, and with that, that's kind of the update. I don't know if the board has anything they, they would like to add. Looking forward to Saturday. <clears throat> Anybody have anything truthful they'd like to <laughs> I will be there on Saturday. <laughs> and then we will have the budget solved. Yeah. Okay. Dora? I just want to add my 
yearly request to look at the phone situation? <laughs> Actually, that is one of the things that we are looking at as What's phones, that? because we are looking at going to um, voice over IP, um, that that's contingent on some other contracts, so. Oh, yeah. so. All right. I, mean, I guess Probably. the other systems question I have is I review the warrants mm -hmm. uh, when they come to us uh, with the select board materials is I wonder if there's a way that the town could improve its purchasing as a whole mm -hmm. in order to save money mm -hmm. uh, in the process. Right. Uh, it's very difficult in reviewing the warrants um, to, to go through each purchase and really determine if we're purchasing in the most effective manner possible. I know that we've got a, a 12, 14 million dollar budget and a lot of that is spent right here in town uh, buying goods and services mm -hmm. and we just want to make sure we're doing that in the most effective manner possible now that's something that obviously has to unfold over time but it's another mm -hmm. systems issue that maybe we can look at and see if we can save any money right. we yeah. have from time to time we have looked at um, um, central purchasing that has um, we actually did central purchasing um, probably about five years ago, it tended not to be, we didn't really find any savings because we do go with local businesses and we, no matter if the municipal center or one department orders paper from someplace, we tend to get the same price um, no matter what department is. We have looked at um, the possibility um, for some of our things of looking at um, buying on a kind of more as a consortium. Um, you can do that sometimes with um, some, some towns will do it with sand, some will do it with um, like gravel or things like that. We've not found that to be cost um, efficient by joining this with the state or with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and some of those because we're actually closer to where we get to some of the sand pits and gravel pits and so we've actually always ended up with a better price going out on our own. Um, but with that said, Part of the reason I can say these things kind of pretty off the top of my head is because it's not just off the top of my head. It's been it, those are some of the things I've been thinking about um, because I think clearly, you know, each year we get the budget. You know, we trim it down, we trim the fat away each year, and you know, I think that we are in a position this year of really needing to go back and look at some of the assumptions that we've made and see if they still hold true. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just ask, <clears throat> it's a pretty broad question, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you, Barb, to, to answer, even try to answer with, with any depth, but, uh, you know, we're one of the few states where counties aren't very strong in terms of government and administration. <clears throat> in a very challenging budget environment, would it make sense to think strategically in that regard, to be more active on a county, to participate more as a member of a county in certain expenses, like purchase of fuel oil, um, um, and, and other things, trying to seek economies of scale in a, in a, in a much, as, as a participant in a wider group? To Queen. Right. That's, so for Saturday. Like that's, well, that's, yeah, is right. that something we can do? Right, well, and that's, that's similar to what I've done with, lo with looking at some of the yeah. consortiums. <laughs> and one of the things like with fuel oil, what we do is we do wholesale purchase and what we do within the town, um, we have different organizations in town that actually use that. Yeah. And so we, so we do do that to some Let's extent. Mm -hmm. However, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not answering that in a way to say, no, we, we've done that, we're not doing it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or Understood. say yes or no in any way. Um, but I, because again, I think at this point, everything needs to be on the table. Great. Okay, thank uh, you. How do you this? Hazard um, mitigation grants. Um, no. With the, um, that's the next item. Um, the, when there is a presidential declared um, emergency or disaster there um, and FEMA comes in and the the state receives and the towns the local the municipalities receive um, financial assistance from FEMA 
there is additional money that comes to states, and it's a, it's it's just a formula: 15 percent of the amount of the FEMA funding that comes in goes to this goes to an additional 15 percent comes into the state for the form of hazard mitigation grants. Um, hazard mitigation grants: all the money comes from FEMA. The actual um, grant program is administered by the um, by the state. And in, in, in the state of Vermont, it's Vermont Emergency Management. Uh, hazard mitigation grants can be utilized by only municipalities are able to apply for hazard mitigation grants. However, municipalities can apply on behalf of um, private um, homeowners. They can on behalf of businesses um, and on behalf of them themselves. Um, Hazard mitigation grants can run the gamut of exciting things like um, head walls for culverts um, to <laughs> <laughs> to hazard mitigation projects such as um, elevation of, of properties um, that are in the flood fringe or other mitigation um, um, techniques such as um, dry flood proofing, things like that. The other thing that can happen in a hazard mitigation grant is acquisition of properties um, that typically referred to as the buyout. Um, we have the state of Vermont is probably getting the largest amount of hazard mitigation funding that they have probably ever received. Um, and so while it Nobody likes to be in a position where they're the recipient of hazard mitigation grants. Um, they are an opportunity to do some mitigation of, um, of disasters or future disasters. Patrick Moreland, the assistant town manager, has been the key person doing the trainings, doing a lot of the research and review. And pretty much, if it goes south, it's going to be his fault. Cool. But <laughs> um, thanks, Ken. Yeah. Hey, nice. But um, fuck. I love it. but he <laughs> is here to give not only the board, but to give citizens um, an update on, you know, just kind of the nuts and bolts of the hazard mitigation grant program, and also to alert people that we will be doing a press release with regard to looking for partners for mitigation projects. So, Patrick. Yes, thank you, Barb. Um, I'm going to probably touch on a few things that Barb just happened to mention, but um, I kind of prepared something, so I'm just going to go ahead and go straight through it. Uh, and I, I think perhaps the place to begin is by discussing, first of all, what is hazard mitigation? Um, mitigation is considered to be any sustained activity that reduces or eliminates the risk to people or properties that arises from natural disasters. Okay. Um, after years of responding to uh, natural disasters across the country, FEMA recognized at some point that it was less expensive to uh, el eliminate the cause uh, uh, of certain natural disasters or the effects of certain natural disasters rather than to repeatedly repair the same damage over and over again. So as a result of this, uh, it's now become a regular component of their response to set aside, as Barb mentioned, 15 percent of the federal aid that would come to the state to uh, a, a state department so that they could set up a competitive grant program. That program is called the Hazard Grant Mitigation Program and in the state of Vermont is administered by Vermont Emergency Management. Uh, Vermont Emergency Management establishes the state priorities and they also set the schedule for this program uh, as to when applications are due and what information is required. Eligible sub-applicants to this program uh, are municipalities, but not just any municipality. They've got to meet municipalities that meet two particular conditions. The first is that they participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, which the town of Brattleboro does. The second is that they must have a previously a FEMA approved uh, hazard mitigation plan. Uh, Brattleboro is fortunate that we have the uh, 2009 All Hazards Local Mitigation Plan, which was prepared by the Hazard Mitigation Committee, uh, which is made up of representatives from the Brattleboro Fire Department, the Brattleboro <coughs> Police Department, the Department of Public Works and Planning Services. It's a very interesting document. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I suggest to everyone that they take the time and do so. Um, 
a variety of different programs or different project types can be funded under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. The Department of Work, Public Works, for example, has provided me with a list, uh, a short list of drainage improvement projects that they would like to see moved forward. So this would be uh, upsizing culverts and uh, um, uh, making various ditching improvements to certain highly vulnerable roads that are uh, that, that tend to suffer washouts on an annual basis. Um, but hazard mitigation projects are not limited to municipalities alone. They can actually uh, be used to support projects put together in partnerships between private properties and local governments. Um, these, can, these types of projects can run the gamut from uh, flood proofing of commercial structures to elevation of residential structures and in certain um, very desperate situations, they can also, uh, hazard mitigation funds can also be used to support acquisition projects or buyouts as they're called. The purpose of a buyout is to permanently remove the vulnerable residential structure from the special uh, flood hazard area by acquiring the property and placing permanent development restrictions upon that land such that FEMA will never again be asked to remake repairs at that location. It should be understood up front that acquisitions are sort of a project of last resort. Property owners that agree to sell their residential homes are unlikely to be fully compensated by the program. <coughs> um, on the other hand, a hazard mitigation acquisition may be the best offer available to them. Uh, the way projects would work Fair market value, pre-event fair market value, is established per location. To that, you would add the cost for site work to bring it back to a green field, uh, any legal expenses, the capping of utilities, the removal of any household hazardous waste, um, and in addition to that, uh, the cost of any duplicate benefits. So. Um, any, any funds that uh, a property owner has received from FEMA, whether through uh, individual assistance or um, from the SBA, would be deducted from any, uh, uh, from any offer. Um, so, uh, one, of the, one of the downsides of the project is, as I mentioned, um, as acquisitions are, are move forward, property owners are very rarely uh, able to receive uh, the full uh, amount that their structure had previously been worth once these other costs have been deducted from the project. There are a great many requirements that go along with a successful hazard mitigation program. First is, it's got to be feasible. We've got to be able to actually pull the project off. It's got to be effective, which means that it can't be just a bricks in the canyon approach. It's got to be, it's got to demonstrate that it will be effective at reducing future expenses for FEMA and that that documentation needs to come from an engineering source. It also has to be cost effective and this is particularly key. Um, the cost to accomplish the project has to be less than the cost of allowing the damage to occur in the future. One notable exception to this requirement uh, are for residential locations that have been deemed substantially damaged. There is no need to prove cost effectiveness in acquiring properties that have been substantially damaged. Um, again, there cannot be any duplication of benefits uh, for a property owner, so any uh, funds that they may have previously received from FEMA or any private insurance payments uh, would be deducted from any offer for any property. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, participation in any kind of hazard mitigation program uh, or project, especially acquisition, has to be entirely voluntary. So that is not just voluntary for the municipality, it's got to be voluntary for the private landowner as well. Um, local governments are expressly forbidden from using eminent domain on any property owner that isn't interested in participating. So. It's an entirely 100% voluntary program, and it's really um, uh, important for property owners to understand that and to actually request of the town uh, that we consider any kind of uh, joint effort. Um, the last thing I'd like to let you guys know is that there is a very 
I would say, almost aggressive timeline. Um, Vermont Emergency Management has decided that project proposals need to be into their department by December 19th, or excuse me, by January 19th, and that they're actually seeking letters of intent uh, per property by December 15th. So we're going to need to get the word out there that this is available uh, and that the town may consider uh, to partner with private property owners on hazard mitigation projects, and we'll be releasing a, a press release uh, to that effect. As Patrick said, this, it's, there's a lot of work to be done over the next two and a half months, two months. Um, so um, we would be looking, if, if possible, we would be looking for assistance on um, administering the hazard mitigation grants. Dora, I think you have a motion. I do. Um, move to approve the use of up to $15,000 of Community Development Block Grant Program to follow. <laughs> oh. Income. Oh. Program income for the purpose of administrative costs related to implementation of a state hazard mitigation grants. Further discussion. I, I, I do I have, a, I have a question, but what I, I wanted to ask Patrick about um, a something in particular. It's not, uh, I don't okay. have a question with any controversy about the motion because I'm no. in favor of the motion. Yeah. Um, Patrick, um, on um, parts of Route 9 and on Elm Street, uh, excuse me, on Flat Street, um, we had such damage that, uh, that we'd never, we'd rather never see again uh, that. Uh, New England Youth Theater was able to prevent by way of floodgates. So there are a lot of businesses up and down there. I, I, you know, and, and just just to some examples, uh, the uh, the Cumberland Farms uh, and, uh, and and liquor store out on uh, Western Avenue, you know, was you know they were that was flooded, and then we've got that building on Church Street that was flooded, and to such an extent that you know we had somebody given a uh, tax. Uh, uh, abatement. Um, we had, you know, Sam's, the the, the, the Latches Theater, the Flat Street Brew Pub, the Boys and Girls Club. You know, just one business. Dotties just clobbered. Could there be an eligibility for floodgates that saved the day at the youth theater installed in a program like what you were just discussing, up and down Flat Street and along? Uh, the, the, the bad floodway um, out on Western Avenue? Would, would floodgates be something that could be covered by this program that you were just discussing? Yes. Great. So how would somebody actually go about applying for that? Well, I, I think at this point in time, what we would be seeking, it, it, it would be impossible for the town to proceed without knowing whether um, individual property owners are interested. So at this point in time, we would need to hear from property owners that they're interested in pursuing this type of, of project for their property because, as I mentioned, it's got to be entirely voluntary. So it's nothing we can impose upon any of those property owners. Uh, at that point, you know, I, I, I think as we move and as we proceed, we're going to need to make a determination um, uh, at this level as to what our priorities are for what projects we're going to submit to the state um, and I I would recommend among other um, influences and in how we prioritize what projects a read of the of the local hazard mitigation plan mm -hmm. and what hazard mitigation plan is that uh, the Brattleboro all hazards mitigation plan we have one yes 2009 2009 great is, and actually, uh, although it's 2009, that was just approved this year by FEMA, 2011. In May. In May. Oh. So it actually is current. Right. Okay. So let's say there was a group of businesses along Flat Street that wanted floodgates. What would they do? Uh, first and foremost, they would likely reach out to the town and indicate their interest. Okay. And how much of a project like that would FEMA cover? Well, um, FEMA would, uh, if approved, cover 75% of the total project cost. Okay. And state? Uh, zero. zero. 
Ah. Again, remember that this money coming in is coming from FEMA, but it's actually state funds because it comes to the state. Uh, so it's a, it's a grant to the state and the state administers it? Yes. Correct. And so we would be supplicants to the state program? Yes. Or applicants? Sub-applicants. 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 Yes. Correct. Sub to whom? To the state. To the, to the state. <laughs> oh, okay. I see. So this, so we would apply to the state. The state would put together a package to present to FEMA, and FEMA would say okay? Right. Correct. Got it. Okay, and the deadline for application is December 16th? No. Um, notification to the state about by, uh, the, the, the town is to submit to the state of Vermont, Vermont Emergency Management Program, no later than December 15th, uh, a, a letter of intent for each particular project. Those project proposals need to be in to the Vermont Emergency Management by January 19th. Meaning that they have to get to the town and the town submits that by the certain date? I mean, this is really a cooperative effort. And what we're mm -hmm. trying to do now, just to put really the time frame really clearly, <clears throat> is we're going to be doing a press release tomorrow on this, started tonight, um, with information of um, who to contact within the town. Part of the idea with trying to use some of the program income funding to assist with this is that we are going to need, because it's going to be so intense over the next couple of months to get this done, um, we need additional assistance. We need additional people on board okay. to help with that. Um, so at this point, again, um, what we need first is we'll, we're, we're going to put out the press release. People will be able to call in to the town manager's office, and then depending on what kind of inf what kind of um, interest we receive, we're going to be determining how we then address people, whether we do individual meetings, whether we do a big meeting, um, those those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. the, the, I will stress, the, this is a great opportunity. These grants are a great opportunity. However, you do need to show that they are cost effective. Um, so there needs to be, there is a cost benefit analysis that's done. And while that may seem simple, um, the reality is that, that it's a, it is a involved process to do a benefit cost analysis or software that we use from FEMA to do it. And so um, people need to be, to need to understand both the opportunities and the, um, the, the hurdles that will be that are presented in front of them, and though these are this is these are the the regulations with regard to the um, to the project or right. to the program. Yeah. Well, so so <coughs> by cost effective, they're talking about a historical record of damage to that property. Mm -hmm. so well, for example, if there was a hotel that sustained that it had to pay six hundred thousand dollars to get its basement pumped out and its heating system and electrical repaired. Histor and it has to show historical repetitive damage. That's repetitive the issue. damage. Well, we had a 500-year flood. I mean, how back to far back do you need to go? You need you need <laughs> three, three minimum minimally three incidents in the last 10 years, or two in the last 10 years. Okay. Dora. Well, just a question. Some listening to you know some of the questions that Chris was asking. Certainly in. Um, the way FEMA gives out their benefits, they differentiate between commercial versus residential property. So is there a differentiation in this process as well? No. I think that's a good answer. There are, there are certain restrictions that, that uh, apply only to commercial properties and, and only to residential properties, but st strictly speaking, they're treated the same except for um, they won't acquire commercial properties. Right. No acquisitions. Uh, the other thing I have is um, given, the, given the time on this, mm -hmm. um, would it make sense to do another informational meeting similar to the ones that were done related to you know, damages and FEMA benefits for the people who are living in those, you know, that may be easier, quite possibly, easier way yeah. to get at everybody. Right, quite possibly, yes. That's We anticipate probably some meetings of groups. But again, because this, um, because it really is, a, each application is a partnership with the town and 
the individuals, you, you do have to continue to have individual meetings. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things uh, when we were actually discussing the finances, which we didn't talk about, is that uh, uh, the cap has been lifted for damage uh, with FEMA, so the hope that Vermont would be getting more assistance uh, is going to come to fruition, actually. Uh, so well, I think that, you know, we were looking at 90% uh, FEMA, 5% state, mm -hmm. and 5% town. That looks like it's being more realistic, although I'm still wondering where the state's going to get, you know, 5% or 1%. Yeah. We, uh, we have heard that, but we still haven't seen any official. They just took a, they, they, they did? just they voted did do the it. Vote? it was, they okay. did the vote, uh, I think, on uh, Monday. Oh, okay. I thought I read it. They, they took the vote. I thought I read it. I must have read it in yesterday's paper or today's paper, but uh, that was good news. Uh, as, as for this, uh, I, I certainly support this. Uh, and uh, this has the potential to help uh, certainly some people in some really uh, uh, tri-park area quickly comes to mind. Uh, some people that uh, are constantly being challenged when we have uh, issues up there. So uh, we have a motion on the, uh, on the floor to hire an additional staff member. Uh, and this money would come from CDBG money. That uh, would be $15,000. And are you ready for that vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, signify by saying aye. 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 Four oh, thank you. Thank you for that update, Patrick. Um, next, next up is the refinancing of uh, vehicle lease purchase agreements. And Mr. O'Connor. Back in early October, I uh, received a call from a company called Municipal Leasing Consultants on Grand Isle, Vermont. And they asked if I would consider a proposal from them to refinance two of our leases with TD Bank uh, through them and their banking partner. And I told them I would look at a proposal from them, and they, they did send us a proposal. Their proposal uh, was to refinance those leases uh, at a, with a lease with them at a rate of 2.71% interest. That rate seemed a little high to me, uh, considering back in July we signed an agreement with a leasing company at 2.1%, 2.14 I believe it was. So I called our bank, Merchants Bank, and asked them what they thought of that rate. And they thought that the rate was a little high. And they, proposed, they said they could give us a proposal if we wanted to consider a bank note to refinance these leases, two leases. So their proposal came in and they proposed a rate of 2.12% on a three-year note. And the savings from doing this over the life of that note would be about $8,400. And um, it seems like a, like a good thing to do from my perspective. And I would propose that we move ahead and, and uh, approve this uh, refinancing, and the bank will then prepare all of the, the documents for your signature at your, your next uh, select board meeting. I move to approve a three-year bank note with Merchants Bank in a principal amount of $405,000 at an interest rate of 2.12%, the proceeds of which will be used to repay and retire two existing lease purchase agreements with TD Equipment Finance, Inc. Okay. Uh, further discussion? What what is I'm sorry, what is the life of the note? I could, three, three years. years. Three years, that's the total life. Okay. You know, savings of eighty four hundred dollars. So further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Four O. Oh, thank you. Thanks, John. Okay. Great work. Um, Do more. <laughs> <laughs> Last, then, we, the board is asked to hold a public hearing and then vote on the addition of Paul's Road to the list of roads in which there is no parking on either side. I would open the public hearing. And seeing no public, I will close the public hearing. <laughs> and. Okay. Um, 
make a motion? Is there a motion? I move to yes. approve adding Paul's Road to Appendix C of the Town Ordinances. Discussion? Seeing none. Just give an explanation of what that means. So that Paul's Road is the road off of um, Route 5 going up to Omega, yeah, to Omega Delta Campus, Delta. Oh, the Delta, Delta Campus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there was a request to have it no parking, um, mainly be mainly due to because they were blocking the snow plow turnaround right. all last winter. And uh, okay. okay. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Four zero. Oh, thank you. Under correspondence on the board has the warrants and the depart monthly department reports um, in their packets and <clears throat> upcoming meetings the um, Wednesday, November 16th, 6.30 p.m. Human Services Review Committee in the Select Board Meeting Room. Thursday, November 17th, 6 p.m. Skateboard Park Committee in the Hannah Cosman. Um, Friday the 18th at 10 a.m., the ADA Advisory Committee at Marlboro College Graduate Center in the VCIL Conference Room. Monday, November 21st, 6 p.m. is the West River Park Meeting at the Gibson Aikens Conference Room, and at 7 p.m. is the Devel Development Review Board in the Select Board Meeting Room. On the November 22nd at 8.30 a.m., Traffic Safety Committee will meet in the Select Board Meeting Room. And on at 5.15 on that same day, the Conservation Commission will meet in the Hannah Cosman. November 28th, the Planning Commission meets in the Select Board Meeting Room at 6 p.m. On Tuesday, the 29th of November, the Finance Committee will meet. This is um, moved from their normal November 22nd meeting. So it's going to be on November 29th, 4.30 p.m., um, in the select board meeting room. 6.30 p.m., the Human Services Review Committee will again meet in the um, Hannah Cosman. December 1st, uh, 6.30 p.m., Skate Park Committee meeting in the Hannah Cosman. December 5th, Solid Waste Committee meeting at 6 p.m. in the Hannah Cosman. December 6th, uh, Tuesday, 6.15 p.m. is the next regular Brattleboro Select Board meeting. And um, also at 6.30 p.m. on the December 6th is a Human Services Review Committee that's at 95 Chestnut Hill. Um, and then don't forget that on Saturday, this Saturday, November 19th at 8.30 a.m., there's a special select board meeting to um, go over in more detail the FY13 budget. Can I add one? On Monday, November 28th at 9 a.m. in the Hasman, Hannah Cosman room is the Liquor Criteria Ad Hoc Committee. Thank you. 9 a.m. And uh, be before I accept the motion to adjourn, I just want to uh, thank uh, Edna Fletcher, who is an employee of the town, and uh, she continues to be a volunteer down in the town clerk's office. And she was working on a data entry program for the town when uh, she was uh, let go uh, due to budgetary constraints. And she has continued to work on that program as a volunteer, and I want to thank her publicly for doing that and completing that project. She's a, a great gal, and uh, thank you for doing that. Having said that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Thank you. Thank you, BCTV. Thank you, press.